Isaiah chapter 19. In fact, several chapters here in this part of the book of Isaiah. Open your Bibles for reference. You and I know that from the federal head of the human race, Adam, came all of the family of the, of the human race, regardless of the color of our skin or where we were born, we came from Adam. Then we know the great tragedy of the flood. When man's heart had become evil continually, the thoughts and the med meditation of his heart was vile and evil. And God sent the flood and destroyed mankind with the exception of eight souls. Noah and Mrs. Noah and Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And after the flood, and when the flood waters had subsided and the earth came up out of the water again, from the loins of these people, the human race as we know it today, it came from them. In the book of Genesis, we have a very clear cut, a very detailed report on the races. And the reason we're having so many problems in the world today is because we've turned our back on the Word of God and we will not listen. That's number one. Now, in the second place, these dreamers, after every world war, like World War I, World War II, we get the idea that we're going to have universal peace without the king. Uh, they're vile dreamers, and some of them are not. Some of them are sincere. But you know, my friend, as long as human beings are like they are today, we're going to have problems. Man, if you don't believe it, you get married. I mean, literally, you'll have problems. You young men, you know, you look at that girl like you could eat her, and after you're married a few months, you wish to God you had. I mean, you have real problems, son. But uh, it's strange why... These people that, that live in our world today can't understand that uh, there's something wrong with us. Mankind as we know him, he's, he's really, he's way out. Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. When I would do good, evil is present with me. You can't even get along with yourself. Don't you know that? Then you do have problems. And my brother and my sister, the only hope for us is to get saved and prepare for that uh, place that Joe was singing about, the choir is singing about. Brother, that's our only hope. There are people in this audience here today that will not see this time next year, even if the Lord doesn't come, because you'll be in the other world. Some of us will be. This congregation so constituted will never be this way again. Some will move on. Because there's a graveyard at the end of every man's journey. And let's face it, it's this way. All right then, let's try to understand what God is doing today. I said to our Bible class this morning announcing this subject, there are four nations. Four nations that stand out in prophecy. And one of them is not mentioned in prophecy. And... Uh, the, so, uh, one of the other is just alluded to, I think, by location, geographically. But the number one nation in our world today is the nation of Israel. And there's no need of us kidding ourselves. We might as well face it. When God called Abraham out there, or the Chaldees, and sent the, the, the people out, he meant exactly what he said and what he was doing. And the nation that blesses these people, he'll bless the nation that curses them. He will curse and it's been this way. If you don't believe it, check history. But uh, God's people disobeyed. And they joined uh, with the Gentiles and started worshiping the idols of the Gentiles. And so God expelled them from the land. And for 2,500 years, they've been under a curse. And whether you like it or not, son, that's the way it is. Now, this is the Word of God. Somebody said the other day, uh, that uh, you ought not to preach these things. Well, now, wait just a minute. I think I'd truly say that I'm a friend of everybody. I don't, have any, I don't have any hatred in my heart against anybody, any nation, any, anybody. I uh, 
I hope that I could pillow my head tonight, sometime tonight, be at peace with my fellow man and with my God. But brother, whether you like it or not, I'm going to preach the Bible. Amen. And the person it hits, it hits. And the person that it blesses, it blesses. And the person it condemns, it condemns. Because I've cast my lot with the Word of God. Now, when I preach a message like this, I'm going to get letters from people saying I don't like it. All right, look at Isaiah chapter 19 and verse 1, the burden of Egypt. I mean, I didn't write that. I just preach it. But that's what the book said, the burden of Egypt. E Egypt's got a burden, and Egypt's had a burden for a long time. And the people of Egypt listening to my broadcast, you just might as well accept it like it is because it's written in the book. The burden of Egypt. That's what it says. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall he be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it, and I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight every one against his brother and every one against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. And he said, The spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof. Now I can go ahead and read a good eel here, but uh, you'll notice in verse 4, The Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel Lord. And then in verse 12, where are they? Where are the wise men? And let them tell thee now, let them know what the Lord of hosts hath purposed upon Egypt. In verse 14, the Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof. And they have caused Egypt to err in, the, in every work thereof as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. And then in verse 15, neither shall there be any work for Egypt which the head or the, uh, uh, which the head or the tail branch or rush may do. In verse 16 it says, In that day shall Egypt be likened to women, and it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shaketh over it. Egypt uh, does have a problem, doesn't it? Verse 17, And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Every one that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself. Verse 19, In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. Verse 20, And it shall be for a sign and for the witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors. Here you're going to find mercy, brother. And he shall send them a Savior and a great one, and he shall deliver them. Verse 21, the Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day. Thank God there's always mercy. Verse 21, the Lord shall be known to, the, to Egypt and to the Egyptians, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow vow unto the Lord, and they shall perform it. Verse 22, and the Lord shall smite Egypt, shall smite Egypt, and he shall smite and heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them, and shall heal them. Isn't that marvelous? Verse 23, In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. Now who are they going to serve? That's a good question, isn't it? You say, well, I don't think people ought to serve people. Well, God writes it the other way. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt. Now, did you get that? And with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt and my people and Assyria, the work of my hands and Israel, mine inheritance. If I should take a text, it would be that one. There will be three of them. Did you know at one time in the book of Isaiah, God said he'd raise up a wicked nation and he called the name of it Assyria to chastise his people. All right now, you'll notice in verse 25, the Lord of hosts shall bless saying, blessed be Egypt, my people. Now he calls Egypt his people and Assyria, the work of mine hands and Israel, mine inheritance. Now brother, that's pretty significant, isn't it? All right now. Give me your attention for a few moments. Let's go back and see a nation that has been rebellious 
and they fought God's people and they have resisted the Holy One of Israel. And because of this, they have really had problems. I call your attention to Psalms chapter 105, if you care to go to that portion of the Word of God. And you'll find in verse 23 these words. Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. Now this, this may move some of you, but did you know that, uh, that the land of Egypt is called the land of Ham? Now you'll go back and we'll find it a little bit later. Why? Now, as I said, Shem, Ham, and Japheth are the three sons of Noah, and the peoples of the world that we know them today came from these three. All right now, it's called the land of Ham in chapter 105 and in verse 23. Now I call your attention to chapter 106 and verse 22. And this is the way this reads. Well, verse 21. They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. You recall how many of the Egyptians were slain in that day. All right, now, again, I call your attention to, uh, to a portion of the Psalms, and this is Psalms 106, Psalms 106 and verses 13 and 14. Now look at this. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Now he's referring, of course, back to this Egyptian experience because it, look at verse 7. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the Red Sea, uh, at the sea, even the Red Sea. Now, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 10. Now this is a portion of the Word of God that you need to understand and we'll take note of verses 6 and 13 through 16. Now in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 6, the sons of Ham. Now we are told there uh, the generations. Now first of all, let's leave that one for just a moment and go back to chapter 10 and verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And of them were sons born after the flood. Now, Japheth is mentioned last. If you have a King James 1611 Bible and you care to go back to the maps, it's pretty easy to find where the sons of Noah settled. And we learn a great deal about the problems of the sons of Noah. Now, I'd like to make this understood. This is not a racist message. This is a message on ethnology that talks about the races. And it tells us the problems of the races. And if I talk about Shem, Ham, and Japheth, I would like to point out very clearly tonight that every one of the sons of Noah had their problems. And it centers around their own stiff-necked and hard-heartedness and their rebellion against God. Now you'll notice in verse 2 of Genesis 10, the sons of Japheth are mentioned. Gomar, which is Germany. Magog, which is Russia. And Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tyrus. We are told there of the sons and where they settled. Look at verse 3 in the sons of Gomar, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togomar. These are the men who are mentioned, are the countries where they settled in Isaiah chapter 38, or rather Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. And the troubles that will ensue as a result of the rebellion and the sins of these people. Now you can put it down, brother. Japheth has had his problems. If you don't believe it, look at Germany. You know Germany persecuted the Jews. And you people who have German blood like I have flowing in your veins, I would say this to you today. Forget your nationality a moment and remember that God judges nations and men because of their attitude and rebellion against him. Now I've got news for you. Whenever you, whenever you finish with Japheth and all of his problems, and you're going to find that Japheth, a part of the seed of Japheth, Russia and, and Gomar and his bands are going to be destroyed in the great tribulation because they sin against God's chosen people, his inheritance. You say, well, I don't think that's right. 
Well, now, it's not for you to judge, my friend. It's what God has to say about it. Now, you talk about a problem, brother. Ham has had a problem. And if you don't believe it, you look at verse 6. And the sons of Ham. And then we have, we have then the sons mentioned in detail. And Ham had a problem right immediately. Look at verse 8. Cush was a son of Ham. He is Ham's, evidently Ham's oldest son. And Cush begat Nimrod. And he began to be a mighty hunter before the Lord. In all of the annals of human history, in 6,000 years, one of the great men, and you can say whatever you please about him, Nimrod was one of the greatest. And Nimrod was the first Gentile world ruler. And he decided with his followers that he would build a tower that would reach unto heaven and would rule the world. And we are told concerning him, look at verse 10, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel or Babel, and Erech and Akkad and Calne in the land of Shinar. And brother, all you need to do is look at ancient history and the maps and you'll find where he settled. In the part of the world where the battle of Armageddon and down in Egypt where this battle's going to be fought, ladies and gentlemen. I say to you that he's really had a problem. Now, when you come on down in verse 20, these are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues in their countries and in their nations. God divided the nations. You know, these one worlders need to understand this. In variety of their spies, as they used to say down south, if everybody looked alike, we'd be messed up, I'd tell you for sure. If everybody acted alike, and we've had an homogenized society in our day. God Almighty made mankind like he is. And if we could understand this, it'd solve a good many of our problems. But you know, mankind has something wrong with him. He's sick, and I'm speaking in a spiritual sense. He doesn't like the way he looks. He's trying to change his looks, and he's trying to change himself. He, he's... He's going against God. If you don't believe it, whenever Nimrod built the tower and said, we're going to have this thing like we want it, God came down and confused the languages so that man would stay scattered and he would stay separate so that he wouldn't kill or annihilate himself from the earth. God Almighty did that. And in the book of Acts chapter 17, and these one-worlders and these apostate preachers always quoted half of this verse that said God made of one nation, uh, made of, uh, of, of one blood all nations that dwell on the face of the earth, but they don't quote this part and set the bounds of their habitation so that they cannot pass. All right then, I'm telling you, Shem has had a problem. If you don't believe it, just study the Bible. Look at verse 21 under Shem also in the Father's the father of the, all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. The children of Shem, and he mentions them here. And you'll find where they settle. These are the sons of Shem after their families and so forth. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generation in their nations, in their nations, notice that. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Now, men and women, let me... Let me say this to you, and my time is slipping by so fast. I'm going to Isaiah chapter 14, and I want you to notice verse 1, and I want to center your thoughts upon this. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will choose Israel, and set them in their own land. And that, my friend, ought to be a fitting text and climax for what I'm talking to you about today. In the Olympic Games recently, we have seen some fine young people slain. And now the morning newspapers have had uh, headlines of uh, retaliation and the unrest that is in that country. I want to say this to you, men and women, that one day there's going to come a thing that will trigger this whole business that will light the fires that's already simmering that's going to cause the nations to have the greatest war that they have ever known or ever shall know according to the book of Nehemiah and he calls it the time of Jacob's trouble and we're coming to that hour. Now let me tell you something. The, the nation of Israel 
and of Egypt and her environs, the nations round about of her peoples. And then I'm going to say this, Russia and Germany that represents, and of course the revival of the old Roman Empire uh, that uh, represents that part of prophecy. And uh, I think the United States figures into this very prominently, the four. Now let me tell you something. I believe the Bible plainly states that there will be a revival of the old Roman Empire. I don't believe it's going to come until after the rapture. And I think the common market uh, of Europe is a, is a preparation for this thing. And I do believe, my friend, that one of these days Russia is going to march down into Egypt to try to take over the Mediterranean and the rich oil fields of Iran and Iraq and all of that country bordering on the Mediterranean, the Great Sea, according to the Word of God. And uh, I believe that there will be an alliance formed with the Egyptians and with that part of the country according to the teaching of the Word of God. And then in addition to that, I do believe tonight that Mr. Nixon's trip to Red China, a country of 800 million people, I believe that China, according to the prophecy, that there's going to come a nation strong with millions, marshalling an army of 200 million men is going to come down into that country and destroy the Russians and the other nations that joined an alliance with them in taking over Israel. And uh, I read in the Word of God that when this happens, that Israel will be seven months bearing the dead to cleanse her land. And according to Isaiah chapter 14, the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel. That's in prophecy. God wrote it. We study it. We believe that God knows what he's talking about. And it may be that this generation of ours are so close. It is so close, I should say, to the coming of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'd say this to you people sitting here today and listening by means of radio that you need to prepare because this world-shaking event, brother, is going to take place sure as well. I tell you now, brother, it's been decreed in the word of God, and God said, my people Israel shall be saved. And God never has lied. And Titus 1 and 2 says he cannot lie. The book of Hebrews says it's impossible for God to lie. And he's made these promises, he's decreed it, and it's going to come to pass. Therefore, have your bags packed and get ready for God because the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised and we shall be changed. And then the Antichrist will come, establish his kingdom. For three and a half years, he'll form an alliance with the people of Israel and then he'll turn and with great fury try to destroy them. But for God's mercy, they would be destroyed. But according to in the book of Revelation chapter seven, there'll be 144,000 Jews saved spiritually and physically. And then the Lord Jesus will come according to Revelation 19 with a trumpet and upon white horses with his people and they will establish the kingdom upon this earth for a thousand years of glorious and peaceful reign. And then, my friend, and only then will this earth know peace. Are you ready for that event? Are you prepared? And brother, we'll sit down every man under his own fire and then under his own fig tree and we'll worship the king. I'm looking forward to that day, aren't you? And we'll study war no more. There won't be any fighting. There won't be any armaments. There won't be $140 billion spent by one nation in armament and preparedness. Brother, I read in the word of God where they'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I'm tired of this fighting, aren't you? I'm tired of the bloodshed. I'm tired of seeing the graveyards where we bury our dead and turn back sorrowful to our homes. I'm tired of seeing hospitals and penitentiaries. I'm tired, my friends, of broken hearts and tear-stained cheeks and bless God. One day when the king comes, it'll be over and every man will sit down and worship the king and we'll serve him forever. Well, that's my message. It's going to come. Yes, how do you know? Because the book said so. Just that simple. Let's stand, please. Father in heaven, I pray the Holy Spirit to move upon this audience tonight as we've tried to briefly go through the Word of God and point out these things that shall come to pass shortly. And now, Father, I pray that Christians will live like Christians, that saved people will live like saved people ought to live, and that every one of us will have a vibrant witness on our lips coming from a pure heart that we might help our fellow man to be saved and get off the broad road that leads to hell on the narrow way that leads to life everlasting. 
and help us to make any and all sacrifices necessary to allow, let our lives count for thee because we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know whether or not you're on this road that leads to hell or this other road that leads to heaven. There are just two ways. One to hell, one to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, 